proponent of capitalism in the wealth of nations, with his concept of the invisible hand of the market, was himself a moral philosopher. Few people are aware of that. And he always assumed that the market was operating within a strong ethical environment. And so he believed that was necessary for capitalism to work, and he strongly opposed anti-competitive practices. Charles Handy says, markets are a mechanism for sorting out the efficient from the inefficient. They are not a substitute for responsibility. Or as Pope John Paul II wrote in Centesimus Annus, the market economy cannot be conducted in an institutional, juridical, or political vacuum. What this means is the economy is part of the fabric of society and is there to serve it. Clearly, much more than regulation is required. What is needed is an understanding of the values on which regulation is based. Here we enter the area of values and ethics and questions of what is right or wrong or good or bad. Markets cannot operate as if they are separate or independent from the communities in which they operate. After all, business has special privileges given to them by the community, such as limited liability. And business depends on the good order and infrastructure of the communities in which they operate. They therefore have an obligation to promote the common good. For without a strong community, there is no strong business environment. So how does business promote integrity in the market and in the workplace? There are many ways in which people are addressing this issue. There's a movement known as corporate social responsibility. This is where companies give money to good causes in the community. It's about being, in other words, a good corporate citizen. Then there's another approach called triple bottom line reporting where annual reports deal not just with financial and legal matters, but also look at the social responsibilities of the organisation. They would have an environmental sort of reporting and some sort of social impact reporting. As well as this, organisations develop codes of ethics and codes of conduct. Now, all of these are useful but really don't get to the heart of the matter. What I believe is needed are an approach to ethics called virtue ethics. On top of that, and what goes with that is needed is good leadership. And out of that comes a good corporate culture, which is based around sound decision-making processes. Now let me just expand briefly on these. A good corporate culture is established by identifying the core values of the organisation and managing them in the organisation. Aristotle, in developing his virtue ethics, emphasised the key values that were needed to be a good citizen in 5th century BC Athens. These he identified as honesty, justice, prudence, courage, and temperance. The reason I stress this approach to ethics is that most ethical approaches assume that provided you can work out what the right course of action is by applying some ethical principle or value, that that will solve the issue. The truth of the matter is, it won't. You can't tell me that Alan Bond did not know what he was doing when he stripped Bell Resources of its assets. What matters is who we have become 
by the choices we make. If it is greed that drives us, you can't but act in that way. Clearly, this is a spiritual as well as an ethical issue. Spirituality is about who we become. Ethics is about how we act. And clearly, the two are intertwined. Virtue, virtuous means strength. It's a question of what strengths we have developed in order to be able to do the right thing. You don't just wake up in the morning and say, I think I'll be honest today. You either are or you aren't honest. Because of the decisions you have made that have shaped who you have become. In this context, leadership also becomes critical. The values of the organisation are developed and passed on through the modelling of the leader. Good leaders develop good cultures in their organisations by identifying and promoting the core values. Let me give you a brief example of this. In the early 1990s, Coles and Woolworth supermarkets, exactly the same sort of businesses that are in competition, were in very different financial situations. Woolworths, in about 1990, came in with a loss of something like $20 million. You know, it should have had hundreds of millions profit. Um, and they employed a man called Paul Simons to take over and run the company, uh, one of Australia's most outstanding businessmen. He turned that company around in 12 months, but it was the power of the man himself that really had the biggest impact on Woolworths. What he did, he gave the people that ran the local supermarkets far more autonomy to, to, to run their businesses. Um, he cut out all the waste and goodness knows what. You know, he would often be seen visiting supermarkets around the country. He would be pushing the trolleys back into the supermarket. He was a fantastic leader. At the same time, Coles had a leader that was head of Myers. He, he went to jail, but the practices in that company were somewhat different. You know, those on the board had been using uh, the maintenance staff to build their beach houses and things like that. There was a sort of entirely different culture. And at that point, Coles had a problem with theft by staff. Woolworths had no theft by staff. Coles had substantial theft by staff. But it was going on at the top, and what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I can't overestimate the importance of leadership in any organisation. And this is what virtue ethics helps bring home to us. In doing my work with the St James Ethics Centre, we'd go into different companies and very quickly you get an idea of what it's like. Whether it's a good company, whether people want to be there, whether there's a high morale, you pick it up very quickly. And once you met the CEO, you understood why. 